Welcome everybody. Thanks for joining uh, to the deal dynamics and market environment during a pandemic discussion. My name is Keenan McCollum. I uh, work with a company called Now CFO, and we'll dig into that. But um, I'm very excited to have um, a very strong panel of private equity and growth equity investors joining us here today for discussion really around how the market is changing, what's been going on, how investors' mindset has been changing in this environment. And, um, you know, just having kind of an open ended discussion on some really interesting points. Um, a couple points of housekeeping for those of you who have just joined us. If you go over to the video box where you can see everybody's face right now, you can click on the rectangle icon where there's two rectangles, one on top of the other one. And that will actually bring up um, all four videos so you can see everybody on the panel's face. Um, as we get going. And then also, um, we're going to be having a, kind of a, a blended Q&A format here. So if you do have any questions, please uh, put them in the Q&A box that you should have in your Zoom window. And I'll make sure to address those kind of in real time as we're going through the discussion. And then at the end, um, if we do have some extra time left over at the end of the hour, we can have a little bit more of a formal Q&A section here. So to get going, um, again, some of the points that we wanted to cover was just to really give everybody a really good understanding, one, of where your company fits within the capital markets right now, especially, but also a really strong update, right, on what's going on in the markets. Things are changing. The pandemic has shut things down. It's changing um, outlooks. It's changing the way that we're growing our businesses, the way we're manage managing them but also the way that investors are looking at the markets. Um, again, whether they're seed, series A, B, buyout, uh, you know, everybody is having to adapt. So again, I'm extremely excited to welcome everybody here. Um, my name is Keenan McCollum. I work with Now CFO, which is a nationwide fractional CFO and accounting firm. I lead the capital raise advisory side of the practice, and we work with companies typically on seed to series B capital raises, where we're coming in, helping them raise capital, whether it be preparation, investor presentations, financial models, overall market strategy, and then actually helping them get in front of investors. Um, we've been pretty broad, done deals all over the country, and currently working with clients all over. Because of COVID, it also allows us to be remote, so it's been a great transition. And right now we're actively working with uh, clients that are doing anything from a seed round to actually some M&A and roll-up strategies. So without further ado, love to introduce our panel here. Um, these gentlemen have all worked with me in different aspects and uh, we're all Southern California based growth and buyout type of investors. Mark Gartner is with Clearlight Partners. Mark and I have now known each other for quite a while, looked at a lot of deals together and Clearlight is a really innovative private equity buyout fund in Newport. So Mark, if you'd like to give a, a quick overview on your background and the fund, that'd be great. Yeah, thanks Keenan. <clears throat> so Clearlight, we're a private equity fund. We've been around since the year 2000. We have sort of a unique origin story in that we grew out of an operating company. Um, our founder uh, way back when was running a residential security business on behalf of a Japanese publicly traded company that he grew from about 35 million of revenue to 250 before its exit. Uh, in the late 90s. Uh, and the sale of that business generated um, meaningful proceeds that were effectively kind of rolled into our first fund. Uh, to this day, all of our capital has come from that Japanese uh, limited partner. And we've now raised in total 900 million across three funds. Um, we've invested historically primarily in founder and family owned uh, businesses across a pretty wide range of industries. Generally speaking, our sectors of interest fall into four categories, consumer, industrial, business services and education and training. Uh, lately, we've spent a lot of time in franchising, have a very strong interest in IT services presently, uh, also children's services related businesses uh, and express car washes, uh, to name a few. And generally our transaction sizes range from maybe 20 million of enterprise value up to 100 million or so. Thanks, Mark. One thing that I'd point out um, that I think you just mentioned with the express car washes is a lot of uh, Clearlight's thesis is um, pretty unique. So if you guys, you know, have companies that maybe you're thinking, hey, uh, where do I fit? I think Mark could be a, a great sounding board and certainly a thought leader in the space. Thanks, Ken. 
Um, and then Christian Kurth. Christian and I go back quite a ways and is another local San Diego um, operator here. JMI, unless I'm mistaken, Christian, I think JMI is probably by far the largest and most significant um, captive capital investor that has significant presence in San Diego with a couple billion in assets under management. Um, would you like to give a little bit of background, Christian? Yeah, uh, thanks, Keenan. I'm excited to, to speak with you folks today. Uh, I think certainly to your question or point um, within technology in San Diego. So um, I've been with the firm for about five years. Uh, and as Keenan mentioned, so we're growth equity focused on B2B software companies. So very exclusively focused on um, those companies in particular, but that really, you know, varies across a wide variety of end markets. So both vertical and horizontal markets. Um, you know, we've been around for almost 30 years as a firm, um, 140 software investments plus over our history. Uh, and we're currently investing out of our ninth fund. Um, our current fund is $1.2 billion. Um, so what that means for us, as far as a typical kind of investment cadence, you know, we do anywhere from five to 10 investments per year. Uh, and the checks that we write range anywhere from 25 million or so on the low end. Um, up to 150 or so uh, on the high end. Um, but I would say an, into a variety of deal types. So, um, you know, we're completely indifferent between minority and majority transactions. Um, our current portfolio is, is split almost exactly 50-50 down the middle. Um, and then as far as kind of stage of business, it also varies. So we consider ourselves stage agnostic. Um, you know, we, uh, most of the companies we back are, are founder-owned businesses. Uh, we've also invested at a Series G round before in the past. So really uh, spanning that spectrum um, and then investing behind a variety of uses of, uh, of capital, whether it's you know, growth capital, liquidity, M&A, uh, most of our deals have at least two of those three things um, in combination. Awesome. Thanks, Christian. I don't know if I've ever heard of um, a significant Series G. Uh, so that's got to be one of the latest stages uh, that I've seen come across in a while. Um, <laughs> so thanks for that. And lastly, Matt Klein with Arrowroot Partners. Um, I, one thing to me that's been really interesting is Matt and I originally connected, I think we were at Marlin, right, Matt? Which yeah. I think was an extremely fast growing um, equity fund. And then uh, Matt transitioned over to Arrowroot. And right after Arrowroot actually was founded, I was connecting and um, watching Arrowroot's growth over the last couple of years has been pretty remarkable. So another really innovative, uh, growth type of equity fund. And I don't know what it is, Matt, but you seem to have some kind of way of finding these extremely fast growing funds. And uh, maybe it's you. I, it, I don't know. I like to think it's me, but I think it's, it's I, I've gotten lucky twice. So let's, let's hope the luck continues. But yeah, so I work at Arrow Capital. In a lot of ways, we probably view the world similar to JMI, but you, you can think of us at an earlier stage in the market. So we look at all B2B enterprise software companies, sometimes mid-market software, but mostly in that kind of enterprise grade. Software, you can think of it as kind of series B, but we've done series A, series B, series C, Ds, and, and sort of founder-backed unbranded series. Um, so a lot of flexibility in the earlier stage of the B2B enterprise software landscape. Globally focused at this point, so we've done deals in the US, Australia, UK, Israel, Canada, so pretty global platform, which is great. Um, we're investing out of our fourth fund. Company was started in 2014, so yeah, to your point, Keenan, it's, it's been a fast growth trajectory. Um, and we've done minority deals, majority deals, founder liquidity, earlier investor liquidity. Um, I'd say the most of the things we look for are super sticky, high retention businesses with, um, you know, Long sales cycles, big implementation costs, but once you're in, you're really kind of mission critical software that um, is hopefully going to be with that customer for 10 plus years. And yeah, that's kind of the quick quick run through on Arrowroot. Awesome, thanks. And and one more thing that I'll just throw out, just so everybody you know gets a little bit more color here. All three of these guys are very flexible. I've I've worked with them on multiple opportunities, and everyone comes back with, hey maybe this isn't the best fit for this certain situation, but here's something else that we can look at. So um, I think it just really speaks to the reality of the capital markets and investors there and, and you know, creating those relationships and being able to have conversations as opposed to viewing 
investors as just you know kind of a binary machine. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to dig into some more of that today in the discussion and, and add some more context. But um, with that, I, I just want to dig in here. Um, so I think one of the things that has been on everybody's mind, obviously, with the pandemic is, are investors still investing? What's going on? It seems like deal volume is down, which it is. Um, it's down about 50% uh, Q1 year over year. And a lot of the deals that are getting done were already really moving along in the process. You know, We had closed a couple in the beginning of the year, but we certainly didn't kick them off. In the beginning of the year, we had kicked them off in 2019. So to that point, um, one thing that I think would be interesting is, Mark, can you provide any kind of uh, insights into how you guys are addressing your target deal volume and just generally what you're thinking about closing deals, um, you know, and, and what that looks like? Yeah, sure. Yeah, to put some numbers around it, Keenan, you know, last year when things were kind of humming along, we were accustomed to seeing maybe 15 to 20 new deals a week, which is a pretty comfortable pace, plenty of things to look at. Um, during peak COVID hysteria, you know, March, April, um, there were many weeks where we saw literally zero deals uh, come over. There's just too much uncertainty. It didn't make sense. Um, it does feel like the deal machine wants to get going again. Um, lately, over the past couple of weeks, we've seen anywhere on the order of call it six to 10 new opportunities, um, which is allowing us to take swings again. Um, I think private equity funds are falling into one of three camps. Um, camp A is just pencils down, wait and see. Uh, camp two is um, being very selective. You know, the bar has gone up to pursue new opportunities and being very cautious not to do anything foolish kind of amidst COVID and in anticipation of what could be perhaps a, a second wave. Um, and then the third is people who are just, you know, business as usual. Um, and so, there's plenty of activity to create, you know, real auctions right now for better or worse, probably better for sellers, not as great for buyers uh, right now, but you know, we are selectively looking at new deals and probably bid on, you know, four or five businesses kind of during, during COVID right now. Do you, that brings up a point on, uh, I guess, timing, right? So have you noticed any decrease in deal quality? Is there any, are you seeing more companies come to you and saying, oh, we're struggling right now. So we need capital. Um, or are you still seeing high quality deal flow and, and maybe you're kind of adjusting your criteria? Um, it's interesting, Keenan. you know, some industries amidst all of this haven't even missed a beat. So it's kind of binary. You know, I mentioned IT services previously, which is largely driven by uh, recurring monthly revenue. And a lot of what those companies can do is kind of remotely managed. And so we have an IT services business in the portfolio that's doing great and growing. Um, and so we haven't seen valuations affected in that space, nor have operations really been disrupted. Um, other industries, it's requiring more investigation to really figuring out what, what is going on. Um, and if there's a blip, how long is that blip going to last? And what are the real implications for COVID? And do you want to proceed uh, given some of the uncertainty? Um, I don't think I've noticed a material degradation in deal quality. Um, you know, if the wheels have really fallen off on a business, I just don't think it's coming to market unless it's being marketed to say uh, a universe of distressed investors. That's not what we do. We're generally investing in healthier companies. And so, you know, maybe we're just being selected, you know, for those businesses that are generally doing okay right now. Got it. Um, Matt or Christian, anything that you can add um, from the growth space on deal volume and maybe even quality? Are, are people coming to you in more of you know, a growth equity kind of situation where they're saying, hey, we really need this to bolster us down through um, you know, the next couple of months? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so similar to what Mark was saying, I think March and April were pretty dreary. Everyone was concerned. Um, a lot of people who had gone out to market had pulled their fundraising process. And then, you know, the PPP loans gave a lot of people in the earlier, um, earlier stage companies a lot more room to run and, and push off the fundraise process. But what we've seen now is things kind of accelerate and, and to Mark's point, people want to get back on the deal flow and get deals going. Um, Companies kind of fall into three categories. One is probably this great software companies, great metrics, great growth, um, you know, limited burn. Um, the second category is probably companies with COVID tailwinds. So working from home, uh, virtual, et cetera, things that ha have helped have, have been accelerating the pandemic. And the third is probably companies that unfortunately circled to 2020 as their fundraise kickoff and, maybe aren't the best companies. And so the first two categories, I think we've seen 
uh, valuations probably increase and, and buyers get more aggressive going after those because everyone's sort of threshold of what a deal looks like has increased and their margin of safety has increased. So they're not, they're not taking on as much risk. So those kind of A plus SaaS companies have really, I'd say their buyer universe or investor universe has increased as people have become more selective. And then those companies that need cash are, you know, they're, they're in a tricky spot and um, some are distressed. Some are looking for, you know, new homes where insiders maybe have given up on them and, and can no longer support every portfolio in their company and are really only now backing the, the true winners. Um, and so the, I think those businesses are, are really in a, in a tough spot right now. And um, that, that's probably the bifurcation we've seen on, on the deal flow. Got it. Okay. Only thing, only thing I'd add, Keenan, is just, you know, on, on the deal volume question, you know, I think for us, and I'm not sure, maybe uh, Mark and Matt can talk about their firm. So we look at deals that are, you know, um, have a banker representative or an advisor um, like now CFO. And then we look at deals that don't have those, those parties as part of it. And for us, kind of the lifeblood of our business is conversations with entrepreneurs and executives it's at, at the end of the day, sourcing and having those conversations are, are how, where we get most of our deal flow. Um, you know, once COVID hit conversations with entrepreneurs, um, it slowed down. You know, we took a much more measured approach um, to outreach, you know, and these conversations, because at the time it, it sounds a little bit tone deaf when, you know, they've got, their family to worry about, their company to worry about in the middle of the pandemic. It's a little bit tone deaf for us to reach out and, and want to talk about capital. But um, so if you look at it from a pipeline perspective, um, you know, less conversation with entrepreneurs in Q2, you know, will have some effect on how many deals we close in Q3 or Q4. But I think what we felt, especially within the past month, um, is that entrepreneurs are ready to move forward. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of tired of talking about COVID. Um, you know, they're looking for creative ways to continue to grow their business. And a lot of folks are going to do something, uh, either raise money or, or some other transaction in Q3 or Q4. So we're anticipating a really active back half of the year. Got it. Well, that's, that's certainly encouraging. Um, and, and leads into, you know, some other thoughts that I, I wanted to make sure we covered. Um, we're starting to get some questions in. And actually, one of them was really a great segue into um, kind of the direction that I was hoping to take this. So, um, Christian, maybe you can help me understand a little bit. When we were out in market, you know, in the first four to six weeks of the official quarantine and the lockdown, a lot of the feedback that we were getting from investors of all shapes and sizes, honestly, was, hey, this may be a good fit for us. However, we're really focused inward. We're kind of bolstering down our portfolio companies. We're realigning ourselves with them to make sure that everybody can survive this. Can you walk us through a little bit what the thought process was on how do we triage our portfolio? Are there some companies um, that we definitely want to reinvest in? Was there anything that you kind of had to, you know, I, I don't know if ties is certainly not the right term for it, but you know, how, how did you go through that decision-making process to understand how much you put in into which portfolio companies? Yeah, definitely. Um, well, that was certainly an all hands on deck kind of exercise in March and April of this year across our portfolio. Um, you know, we have roughly 30 portfolio companies and um, we went through a pretty similar process, I'd say, um, for each of them. So the, the first and easiest thing we did uh, across the portfolio would be, you know, implementing a hiring freeze. Um, so when COVID hit, we didn't know what the world was going to look like a few months from now. So putting headcount increases on pause until we had a better sense of what was to come it, that was probably the safest and easiest thing to do at, at all of our companies. Um, and then from there, it was a lot of kind of the what if and scenario planning analysis. Um, so what's the best case, worst case scenario, you know, for 2020 and 2021. And then what do we believe is kind of our reforecasted base case for each company uh, for this upcoming year. And what that led into really is the key question around capital needs. So do we have enough cash? Uh, to weather the storm and what is likely to be a much tougher 2020 than we had all anticipated, you know, when we were putting our budgets together uh, at the start of the year. So, um, you know, I think even for our companies that were in, are and were in a very healthy cash position, I think the easiest, um, you know, kind of form of self-defense on, on the cash front uh, is drawing down revolving lines of credit. Um, and I'm sure, Keenan, you've you had conversations with, with uh, the folks you're advising on this, but that's 
um, at the time, you know, better, better to have the cash in the door when you don't need it than having to ask for it down the road when things tighten up. So that, that, that's the easiest form of self-defense we found. Um, you know, in addition to that, and it's a longer process that we probably don't have time to get into today, it's how do we navigate the PPP process, you know, which of our companies are eligible, um, how much incremental could we get through that program, et cetera. Um, and then finally, you know, we took a closer look at, you know, discretionary expenses at each of our companies and um, figuring out if there were ways to trim. So, you know, one really easy one off top ahead is, you know, travel for our sales teams, for example. That's not happening, right? So that was an easy one to go out the window. And um, I think our general bias as a firm, you know, if there are going to be discretionary cost cuts to be made, um, better to focus those on more of the customer facing activities that have been hit, um, so sales and customer success. Um, you know, we almost never want to cut costs related to product or development. You know, I think we found that downturns are a really good time to continue investing, um, you know, investing in and bolstering our product. So, you know, um, really one to sustain competitive advantage. And then two, when we come out of the pandemic, you know, we've got an even stronger offering. So uh, long answer. I mean, the good news is, is that um, most of our companies, you know, had and, and have a pretty healthy cash position. Only a few will require reinvestment, but I think it's a good exercise and you know, we've encouraged our management teams to push on, you know, what's your revised view for 2020 and 2021 um, and just understand all the different potential scenarios and, and, and how to plan and mitigate for them. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, Mark, you guys aren't quite as tech focused as uh, Arrow Root and JMI. Did you have a similar approach? You know, if, if you're looking at some of, um, you know, like you had you mentioned express car washes, things like that. Um, what was your view with those types of businesses? Yeah, it was interesting experience <clears throat> living through kind of March and April because the problems came on faster and in varieties that we just hadn't seen before. So the, the analogy of an all hands on deck experience was absolutely true. Um, you know, across our portfolio, um, our portfolio is more modestly sized. We have eight companies. It was kind of three bowls of porridge. You had, you know, some companies that, you know, had pretty dramatic reversals of fortune, some that were kind of uh, relatively steady uh, and easier to manage through, and actually a few that were actually benefiting. And so you naturally gravitated towards the ones where, you know, there were many uh, fires to fight. Um, so that, that's how we approached that experience. And again, it was just, it was such an unprecedented time. Um, a lot of the things that Christian referenced to strategies that they undertook, drawing down on revolvers and so forth, are things we absolutely did as well. And so I think those conclusions, um, are applicable kind of across industries for the most part. And I thought his comments were well said. Great. Um, so uh, another question that we just got um, kind of leads into a, a broader discussion around, um, are we underwriting differently? Are there different things that we're looking for now? Matt, can you speak at all to, um, if there's any anything that's changed in what makes an attractive deal? Are you guys saying, okay, well, is this pandemic proof? Um, you know, and then also is historical cash flow management and uh, just um, more financials becoming a more important thing as you underwrite this? Walk me through that. Yeah, sure, sure. I think our, yeah, I, I think our quote sweet spot of what a deal looks like and thresholds have all moved up quite a bit. So Historically, I think we were comfortable investing at the earliest stage in, in businesses doing kind of 3 million of annual recurring revenue. Um, and that, that number's probably moved up quite a bit. And along with that, we used to be, you know, we used to be, and we still are comfortable with a couple of key identified risks, whether that be a large customer concentration or, you know, not tier one, but improving retention rates and something we can work on, or maybe some longer sales cycles that can be improved over time. I think we're, we're less comfortable with multiple issues with a business um, where historically maybe we would have been comfortable with one customer being 40% of, of revenue, but now with COVID and people rethinking their, their digital spend, I think that um, just the margin of safety and, and kind of thresholds have all moved up pretty significantly and we're we're not um avoiding sort of businesses getting hit by by the pandemic directly I, i'd say i think most businesses in the kind of travel leisure events hospitality space are 
probably scrambling on their own to kind of figure out insider led rounds and, and ride out the storm. I think anyone with, with optionality with either insiders or lenders or um, things like that are probably realizing they're going to get hit pretty hard on the valuation front if they go out right now. So I think those sort of pandemic, high pandemic impacted businesses are probably trying to survive on their own without, um, without going out to market and kind of get, getting a pretty significant hit to their expected valuation multiples. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Christian, as you guys, I mean, I, I would imagine some of the deals you're looking at probably has EBITDA. Um, obviously, you know, revenue growth is really important. Have you incorporated any kind of COVID adjustments? You know, on the buyout side, I've been seeing some people, you know, really adjusting for COVID from an EBITDA perspective. But have you incorporated that or anything on the revenue side to where you're saying now, well, we would have anticipated it to continue to grow at a certain rate. We understand it got dropped down by 20%, but we're comfortable with that through kind of Q2. Yeah, it's a good question. And I think the, um, we're, we're still figuring it out. So, right, I mean, I think um, there are very few industries that are seeing a tailwind here because of COVID, right? Um, you know, so most companies, even if they were performing exceptionally well pre-COVID, are going to have some kind of downturn in, in, in revenue uh, at the very least. Um, so no, I, I've read about the crazy kind of COVID adjustments or COVID adjusted EBITDA. I think, you know, we'll look to break those down and, and get into the details on a deal by deal basis, but nothing that I'd say is a hard and, and, and fast rule. Um, it's just, uh, I think for the companies that, um, that are performing or have managed to still perform through this, um, it's really teasing out whether this is a kind of rising tide that lifts all the boats in this particular subsegment of this market and it's kind of more of a one-time blip um, or, you know, is it a sustainable advantage that this company can continue to capitalize on? So no, no, no hard and fast rule, but it's something that, you know, I think we're all going to have to get smarter on as, as we look at more deals later this year. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, so it's something else, you know, that we get asked all the time is timeline, right? Before COVID, we had kind of our general metrics, you know, this is what we should expect. Um, from a process perspective, you know, you need to manage cash flow about six months um, to close. Um, maybe this is just kind of a broad question. Have any of you experienced a drawn out due diligence process or just kind of readjusted your timeline expectations to actually close a deal because of some of what we've already talked about? We really need to get granular into the numbers, plan for multiple scenarios that we wouldn't have prior. Has that drawn out um, any of the closings or any of the um, uh, processes you've been working on? You know, I've got a thought on that. You know, I think the expectation for buyers and sellers alike is that things are just going to take a little bit longer, uh, which is fine. Um, I think one thing that we've attempted to do or will be attempting to do is seeking longer exclusivity periods in our deals just to kind of manage that and, and manage expectations. Um, I think a lot of our diligence work streams can be done remotely. Um, and so there hasn't been much disruption there. What really comes into play is kind of the in-person, on-site uh, type of due diligence uh, work streams. So, you know, things are going to take a little bit longer, but, you know, we're all going to adapt to this. And I think things are going to get more efficient um, and they're going to get, you know, we're going to get better at not having kind of process delays along the way. But yeah, I do think there is, you know, some expectation of things taking a little bit longer, at least in the near and medium term. Got it. Yeah. Um, so one thing that you just touched on actually was kind of like the remote management meetings, you know, that whole concept and, and what happens, how do you close a deal without meeting in person? Um, so I actually found some data where, you know, and curious what you all think about this, but 70% or so of institutional investors right now are actually getting comfortable with closing a deal without ever meeting in person. Um, is that kind of policy? What What are you guys' thoughts? Is that something that your firms are willing and able to accomplish without an actual in-person management meeting? Yeah, I, I think, um, I guess from our perspective, maybe two months ago, we would have said, no, we definitely need to meet in person. But I mean, this could be another six months before people are willing to jump on airplanes and go meet each other in person. So I think we were prop. I, I know we're comfortable closing a deal via, you know, zoom meetings and remote diligence. That being said, you know, it's a five plus year marriage on our side and on the management team side. And there's, you know, 
no option for divorce in these types of deals. So you really need to get along with the team and like working together. And so I think you need to, I mean, we're doing things like virtual happy hours with the management teams. I think you need to do deeper and more thorough kind of personal reference calls and, and really dig into your own personal network to find friends of friends of CEOs and CFOs and, and, you know, vice versa, them digging into us a bit more to make sure there, there is a match there. But yeah, I think it's, it's easy to say, it's easy to say we would do a deal, you know, without ever meeting management team. We haven't done it yet. I don't know if anyone else has, but it's um, another hurdle to actually do it and, and commit to a kind of five to eight year relationship. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, only thing I'd add is, is, is I think spot on what Matt and Mark both said. I, the, the relationship building piece is where we're all going to need to be creative. You know, I've heard of ideas of, you know, backyard barbecues and things outdoors to try and, and meet management teams and, and, and folks that way. So that's where Zoom falls down. Um, we haven't got there yet. My guess is we, you know, I don't think we're going to wire funds without meeting someone in person. You know, I, 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 I doubt it, but I think Zoom, I've been really impressed with how quickly our industry and everyone in general has adapted to Zoom. And I think um, you know, my hunch is that as investors, um, you know, the amount that we travel is going to decrease over time, or at least, you know, it, when we get back to steady state or normal, whatever you want to call it, I think the amount of travel that we do will be less just because people are so comfortable doing what we're doing right now. Um, and there's an argument to be said that Zoom can actually make, you know, a lot of the upfront diligence um, more efficient, you know, as, as compared to in-person meetings with Zooms, people tend not to be late. Um, you know, they're, they're more direct. Um, so uh, I think the, the industry is evolving, um, but I, I, we're not doing it yet. Um, but I, I've heard people are getting on planes again to go, to go visit folks. So I think it, it, it's coming. Interesting. Do you think the only thing I would add to that, Keenan, um, you know, they say never say never, you know, meeting in person for us is one of the more valuable pieces of the due diligence process and really building a relationship. I think Matt used the marriage analogy of five plus years, you know, in our case, we have a single limited partner, so our investment horizon tends to be a touch longer. I think on average, we're investing over maybe a seven-year uh, period. So it's a very lengthy relationship, and you really want to know, you know, the people that you're, you're kind of getting into business with. Um, but, you know, people have to adapt. And so, yeah, you do hear about these kind of purely virtual deals getting done. We have not done that yet. Um, maybe you get to a point where you start to consider that. Um, I think what's interesting in the near term is there seems to be a bit of a premium on the, the local deal, the, the maybe proprietary deal in your backyard that you can drive to, uh, because then those are meetings that you can pretty easily take without getting on an airplane and maybe just get more comfortable with those because those meetings can be held in person in some fashion. So um, the local deal seems to be getting a lot of attention uh, these days because it feels like the way things used to be. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so, Something else that has been interesting, you know, to that point of travel and everything, it seems like lenders, especially commercial lenders, uh, at least from my experience over the last month or two, are really drawing a hard line where if it's not a local deal um, and if they're not able to send it to another office, then they're just not even going to take a look. Um, if you guys are either looking at bringing in debt for portfolio companies or Mark, maybe, you know, I don't know if you guys are bolting on any kind of debt from another party for some of the LBOs you're doing. Um, have you had any experience with that where it's it's really tough moving the needle um, on the debt side? Who's the question for, Keenan? Uh, so I, I, I guess, Mark, if, if you can touch on that from the perspective of, you know, possibly either needing to bring in debt to close a deal or uh, to help, you know, supplement a portfolio company, um, that would be a great place. And then we'd love to hear from Matt and Christian as well. Yeah, I'll talk about the New Deal front. Um, we, we don't have a tremendous amount of data points, honestly. Um, what's good about our fund is that we can <clears throat> fund a deal with all equity if need be. And so if a lender doesn't come through, it's not kind of a, a make or break uh, dynamic of the deal. Um, I think the first part for us is figuring out who still is in the lending business and who can credibly kind of get a deal done. And then once you kind of figure that out, how much leverage is available and what implications that, does that have on valuation? Um, big picture, we generally feel like in terms of total leverage availability, it's kind of down by about 20%. Yeah. And so there's just less leverage available and we have to factor that into our modeling. Um, but you know, we, we haven't had trouble necessarily amidst the kind of vast array of lenders out there figuring out who still is you know, offering debt capital and who's willing to kind of 
put money out kind of in this market. So th there are lenders that are still very much in business. I think, um, at least from the JMI perspective, you know, we've experienced this more, I mean, through COVID with our existing portfolio companies more so than, you know, lining up debt as part of a new deal. Um, so I think some interesting learnings that we found over the past few months. So um, with lenders, their first priority um, is their existing portfolio. So you know, to the point of like people drawing down the revolvers, um, you know, a lot of the lenders were facing reduced liquidity uh, as part of that. Um, so, you know, they were focused on meeting that need kind of first and foremost. Uh, I think beyond that, if you think about a lender, you've got a portfolio of companies, um, all of them are reforecasting 2021, every single one of them. Um, so there's a lot of implications with that for covenants and, you know, other terms and the debt agreements, which, um, you know, that's a lot of fires to put out if you're a lender. So those two things, the focus on the, their internal portfolio really kind of resulted in a general log jam, um, you know, getting through credit committees for any new issuance. So I think a fair assumption, and hopefully things are you know, we're starting to come out of this, but I think a fair assumption is that any new issuance is going to take two to three times longer than typical. Um, and then for a new issuance, I think there's been a general kind of shrinking of the strike zone, if you will, for a lot of these lenders. So, um, you know, they're going to focus on higher quality assets, um, probably going to stay further away from companies that are in industries that are, you know, directly hit by COVID. Um, and then the terms have become much more lender friendly. So, you know, I think everyone should expect, you know, higher interest rates, higher fees. Um, so kind of the, our learning and the recommendation, if you need to get debt in place, and again, more, this is more from a, you know, uh, from a portfolio side versus a new deal. If you need to get debt in place, um, I would start with any existing relationships that you have. And then beyond that, I would go broader. So more lenders, more names than you probably would have before um, and start earlier because it's going to take more time. Yeah. Yeah. I concur with that. Yeah. And we, Keenan, we don't, we don't, so all of our businesses are burning money when we invest. So it's typically only an equity investment. Um, we will raise small pieces of debt as they grow to kind of extend runway. Um, and I will say, I think it, Robert Smith, who's the co-founder of Vista, he was really the first to kind of pioneer essentially lending off of recurring revenue. And, and it's been really interesting to see a lot of our businesses with sort of 90% plus gross retention that were maybe thinking about refining their debt have had, have actually gotten a lot of traction within the lender community. And, but I think we're still in the midst of everyone sort of wondering, you know, is software really, is that kind of recurring revenue really good debt collateral and then we're kind of in the, the middle of a wait and see mode and so we're kind of waiting as well I, I think it is interesting we we're i've been in discussions with like a, a company providing software to the aviation industry which is obviously clearly getting hammered right now and they a couple of their companies have gone bankrupt and they're actually paying their software bills before they pay their interest on their debt because they literally can't fly the plane without the software so I think these truly mission critical software companies are going to still have an, a relatively easy time raising debt. But to Christian's point, it is certainly getting more expensive. And um, so, but we're, I think we're in the middle of a wait and see moment. Yeah. Yeah. I got it. That makes sense. Um, so we're getting a lot of questions on valuation expectations around that from different stages. I think we kind of touched on it a, a bit briefly, but um, it was actually a little bit opposite of what I was expecting. It sounds like you guys are kind of expecting the good quality deals to at least hold what we've been seeing historically over the last six to 12 months. Um, on the flip side, I've been seeing a lot of data where institutionals are expecting valuations to drop 20 to 30% kind of broadly over seed to, to high growth type of deals. Um, Mark, on the, on the buyout side where you know metrics and actual multiples um, are pretty, not straightforward, but well-known. Have you guys seen anything there where you're expecting them to drop overall, or do you think they actually will hold strong? There might be a near-term drop, and I think that would reflect what's going on with the debt markets. Um, but I think I mentioned this previously, it's a bit binary. You've got industries that have held up really well amidst COVID, and in that case, I don't think valuations have been affected at all. In some cases, these are businesses that uh, have proven their resilience and might even get a premium. Uh, as a result. 
In other cases, you know, we're looking for valuation guidance from intermediaries because of so much uncertainty right now. And they kind of shrug their shoulders and they say, well, we'll just have to wait and see what comes in. Um, we put in a bid on a business a month or two ago uh, that we thought was kind of interesting. Um, and the feedback from the bankers, they got 31 IOIs, 31 IOIs, you know, wow. amidst all of this. And so that is a very robust auction by anyone's uh, definition. Now, how many of those uh, buyers are actually going to get to the, the finish line? Um, don't know, um, but still quite a bit of activity and more than enough activity to create, um, you know, a tough, uh, tough buyer environment, even amidst COVID. Um, I think that the bigger overpowering issue, honestly, though, the, the constant amidst all of this is the amount of undeployed capital. So COVID, no COVID, there's a tremendous amount of private equity money on the sidelines. People's careers are attached to deploying that money wisely. So you can't sit idle forever. That money has to get spent. You know, the number that gets thrown around is over 1.5 trillion globally that has to be deployed. So people are going to figure out a way to, to make that happen. And I think that's going to result in a re-equilibration of, of the valuations we've come to, I guess, enjoy as sellers of businesses and you know, lament as buyers uh, relatively soon. Yeah, interesting. Matt, on, on kind of, you know, on the growth side where you guys play, um, would you say that's consistent with your thought process or are you running across people who are actually willing to take a little bit of a valuation dip to get a deal done? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's sort of, there's two camps. So I, I think, look, kind of A plus software companies that are publicly traded have had a huge, you know, you've seen their valuations increase dramatically over the last couple of months. And I think that's just the broader focus on digital transformation, people being, you know, quickly realizing the need for flexibility and their, you know, IT infrastructure and the ability to work from home, the ability to, for retailers to quickly switch to a kind of e-commerce first platform. Um, so you are seeing this kind of broader spotlight on digital transformation, which I think is helping the early stage SaaS companies and help, helping things move through the pipeline. Um, and to Mark's point, you know, I, there's, there's so much capital on the sidelines that, Sure, everyone wants a correction on the valuations they're getting into these businesses at, but if a company goes to 10 investors and they, you know, are all 10 going to say no at a 10% discount, maybe, but are all 10 going to, maybe one will say yes at a 15% discount. Certainly someone might say yes at a 25. I just don't see like a 30 to 40% hit to valuations for businesses that are actually doing decently well um, in kind of that first camp of, of good software businesses. But yeah, businesses that are subpar metrics, burning a lot of money, um, I would certainly be hesitant to go out and raise right now if I were them. I think there's going to be a lot of, of uh, call them arranged marriages between a couple of subscale software businesses that are both burning money, could benefit a bit from economies of scale, could, could accelerate some cost reductions to lower burn. So I think you'll see a lot of kind of mergers of equals over the next 12 months here for people who find themselves in that less fortunate camp and can't go out and raise money at a nice valuation. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that, that takes me to an interesting point. Um, you know, Matt and Christian both have worked with me on different potential um, basically strategic acquisitions. You know, if we have a deal that maybe isn't a fit for the fund, but one of their portfolio companies could be interested that, you know, is, is, quite often a pretty good opportunity um, and certainly worth the discussion. Um, Christian, I'm curious if, so that is an option, you know, for people who kind of need maybe some creative financings. Have you seen anybody, and we've talked about this on at least one occasion, um, but have you seen anybody that is coming to you and saying, hey, we need capital, we're gonna go acquire and maybe do a roll up in our space because we think this is a good buying opportunity um, has there been an increase of that that you've come across or, or have you seen any other kind of creative paths uh, that people are trying to take to raise? Yeah, it's, um, it's a good question. I think um, from, from a JMI standpoint, uh, we are active on M&A. So, you know, across our portfolio, you know, we've probably done a dozen, two dozen acquisitions over the past, you know, 12 to 24 months. Um, so we do that all the time. It's less common for us to come in with kind of a roll up thesis. It's just le less of our model. Um, so we just, we just don't see as many deals like, like that. Um, but I think the, the general point is, is that M and a, you know, for maybe 
not an A plus asset, you know, where it's again to, to what Mark and, and Matt said, those companies are still going to garner, you know, uh, what I would have <laughs> very attractive, hefty multiples, but for, you know, maybe the, the B or C asset, um, M and A, I think is going to be a, a pretty relevant thing, at least over the, the, the next 12 to 24 months, a lot of those companies are going to need to find a logical home. Um, you know, and if they can't go out and raise more money, um, you know, I think, I think there's a lot of opportunities both for, you know, PE backed or, 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 you know, venture backed companies, and then, you know, just larger strategics as well for M and A over the next 12 months. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's pretty consistent with what, what we've been seeing and kind of sensing in the market as well. Um, so, you know, covering valuation, covering process, timeline and everything, um, to me, a really important piece is the due diligence process and, you know, what are some of the key metrics? How are people underwriting deals? Mark, I don't know if you guys have kind of taken a different stance or adapted in any way, but has there been any significant changes in the way that you guys are underwriting and thinking about running diligence on some of the deals that you've been looking at? It's a good question. I would say no material change to how we're underwriting. I mean, a lot of our investment criteria remains the same. I mentioned previously the bar has kind of gone up for our pursuit of a new business. I think um, there's a lot of creative bankering, if you will, around adjusted EBITDA at this point and kind of COVID adjustments. You know, we're accustomed to an environment where as much as maybe 20, 30% of adjusted EBITDA is adjustments, you know, to begin with. And now you got coronavirus on top of that. And so it's just requiring more investigation into, you know, what is true EBITDA. And so I would say that's frankly the biggest change that we've, uh, that we've encountered, you know, amidst all of this. Okay. Well, first of all, I love the term creative bankering. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, You're welcome to use that anytime. Yeah, I'd have to. I think that perfectly describes it. Um, Matt or Christian, has there been anything that you've focused on? You know, if, if on the buyout side, obviously really making sure that EBITDA is the true numbers that we're uh, looking at. Has there been any sources of increased concern that you're spending more time on as you're uh, going through your due diligence? I think it's for us just a higher, um, the bar is raised a bit on just how mission critical is this software? Cause it's an easy thing to cut software spending at a company. If you, you need to cut a couple million dollars out of your, your P and L. And so we're anything that's not truly mission critical to where the company went, disappeared tomorrow, their customers would really struggle in one way, shape or form. I think that's kind of the, the key thing we're focused on right now. Got it. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so as we kind of get into the home stretch here, I just wanted to cover some kind of just, you know, general and broader thoughts and sentiments. Um, one, one, point of interest, especially on the private equity side, has always been, you know, um, we are very, by, not necessarily by the book, but kind of creatures of habit. We do things a certain way. Um, and obviously, everybody's had to greatly adjust and adapt and kind of overcome a lot of these challenges. So, you know, as we're marching into Q3, we've kind of been in the quarantine for, I think, at least a quarter now. Um, I'm curious if, if you think there's going to be anything that really sticks that that we're going to change habits going forward and that the investment community or at least with your funds are going to be different. So, Mark, I don't know if if you see anything really being different going forward. Have you guys kind of changed habits or old ways of doing business and now maybe you found a better way to do things? It's a great question. You know, the one that hits me most prominently is just the need or not to be in the office. Um, I think a lot of industries have evolved on their own timelines. Some have been a bit more progressive where people can work from home at their leisure. Others kind of, you know, still mandate FaceTime and they kind of like in-person meetings with more frequency. I think everybody is getting much more comfortable with working remotely and realizing that productivity can be just as good, if not better, um, even when you're outside of the office. And just thinking about how people allocate just time and the amount of time that's spent commuting and, and traveling to and from various locations and then what you could do with that time uh, to enhance your life or enhance your productivity. So I really think that's going to be the biggest change. I don't think that, you know, uh, the management of companies are going to demand as much physical in-person presence as they used to, and they're going to have to trust their uh, workforces that they're being productive and there's ways to manage and monitor that. And, and I frankly think that's going to be the biggest, one of the biggest change. That and uh, potentially handshakes going away forever. Don't know. <laughs> Replace them with either the elbow bump or fist bump. 
That's right. <laughs> nice. Uh, Christian, any, any thoughts on that? Have, have you noticed, obviously you're still remote. I know that, but any big movements? Um, I know, you know, like you, I'm sure you're happy not sitting in traffic for a couple hours a day. So <laughs> how do you think you know, there's anything? No. Yeah, I think, I think Mark covered it. I mean, that, that's the biggest change I think in, and it goes beyond like work, right? It's just, it's, it's how you allocate even, even your personal time. So I think um, I'd echo hundred percent with Mark said, we're all going to have to figure out, you know, in six months is, is, you know, is the same working cadence that we're doing today. Does that make sense to keep, you know, doing going forward? So I, I don't have a ton to add on that. I, I think uh, uh, we're going to do a lot more meetings like this for sure. Let less airplane. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So we just got a question in, I think uh, just to piggyback on that comment, Christian, it might be interesting. Um, have you guys been seeing any uh, real adjustment in deal terms that buyers are asking for, maybe that you guys are asking for to cover? You know, we, we mentioned an, an extension on exclusivity period. I've been seeing that increase to 60 days um, and, and actually pushing for more. Has there been anything else that's kind of trying to, to gain some maybe additional oversight or control? Um, you know, now that everybody's starting to build up some scar tissue from some painful times? Um, well, we, uh, so we haven't closed a deal since COVID hit, um, a, a new, new deal. Um, we've done some M&A, but I think um, that, that's the one that I've heard the most is increasing the exclusivity period. And then, you know, I think the reality is, you know, if, if, if we're getting up to the end of that exclusivity period and then you know, the things are marching towards close nicely, like there's always extensions, but um I think just people being flexible. This is, you know, guys, we're going to do our best, but this is going to take longer than it typically might. Um, I think that's that's the that's the main one. But um, I'll have a better answer hopefully in the next month or two as we get closer to, to closing a, a new deals here during this time. Sure. Yeah, that's that's super helpful. Um, so we're getting another question, and and everybody um, will probably take another you know five minutes or so. So if you do have questions please uh, enter them into the Q&A box. We're getting some really good ones here. Um, Matt, maybe you can speak a little bit to, you know, pressure from LPs, right? Uh, have you guys been hearing anything to, to kind of increase uh, the exit timeline? Are you starting to get a little bit of pressure from your investors on, hey, let's, let's either look at um, kind of taking advantage of our redemption rights or, you know, guiding a company to an exit? Has there been any kind of discussion around that? Or are they just saying, hey, you know, like we've already discussed, there's still plenty of dry powder. Let's just continue as is and make sure that we're at least kind of surviving this. Yeah, we we haven't had any pressure for exits, um, which is great. I think uh, I think to most people's point here, it's valuation, valuations, especially in the enterprise software world have if anything increased in some ways. And so I think it's a good time to sell if you can. Um, so I think there is some rethinking with management teams of, hey, maybe we were going to think about an exit in 2022. Maybe we should push it up to 2021 because it's a pretty frothy market still and in the early stage enterprise software landscape. But no, no pressure for liquidity or, or anything like that. And, and um, which has been great. I mean, we have run into companies that are fundraising because their their investors are friends, families, high net worths that have just lost a significant portion of their money either in the stock market or a real estate portfolio or they're highly exposed to retail. And so we have seen some like insiders, some people fundraising just due to insider pressure to give them liquidity, but nothing within our portfolio. Got it. Okay. Mark, any, any additional comments or have you guys been pretty untouched by that as well? This is on the topic of LP pressure, Keenan. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so with a single limited partner, they don't exert much pressure at all. We have the benefit of exiting when it makes most sense to do it. You know, most private equity funds seem to want to exit around a five year cycle. I mentioned our average hold period is around seven years, okay. which is an interesting academic exercise. If a fund is left to its own devices, where does that settle out organically? And for us, it's been about around seven years. So no, no, no pressure on, on exits at this point. That's great. Okay. Um, well, I think we should um, start wrapping up here. You know, I think we really appreciate the time you guys, you know, I think we covered everything from, uh, you know, just current market climate, how you guys are each looking at the deal flow and, 
and analyzing deals from a buyout and then different sizes of growth. I think that's been extremely helpful in just understanding how the investment community is really beginning to kind of adapt, right? And what's gonna change? What does the world look like after we come out of this? Because the only thing that we know is that it's not gonna be looking the same as when we win it. So um, I really wanna thank you all again for joining and thank you to everybody who's joined us um, on the attendee side. Um, if there's any closing thoughts, uh, maybe if each of you can just tell us, you know, like when is the best time to reach out to you? You know, if I'm an entrepreneur, I have a company I'm thinking about raising or maybe selling, how do I get in touch? When's the best time? And uh, what is the ideal type of situation? So Mark, let's just start with you. Yeah, there's a quote I want to share as a closing thought. Uh, Winston Churchill said something to the effect of never let a crisis go to waste. And so I think amidst all of this, it's easy to lament a lot of the challenges that we're all experiencing during COVID, um, but there will be very real opportunities for people to capitalize on if they're vigilant you know, to pursuing those. So I just encourage everybody you know, not to get bogged down in kind of the challenges, but let's figure out how we can kind of make the best of the situation. Um, you'd asked another question, Keenan. sorry, what was your final yeah, question? When, what, it, what is an ideal fit for uh, Clearlight? Oh. How and, and when should somebody reach out to you to start that conversation? Yeah, I would say early and often. I mean, that, that's what I'm here for. It's always great to, you know, have conversations about deals, prospective deals, you know, founder family owned business that has at least, you know, two or three million of LTM EBITDA and is starting to think about an exit and wants to start perspective on how we think about valuation and our process and our experiences. Always happy to have those calls. So I would encourage anybody who's interested to, to reach out. Awesome. And, and one thing I would add to that is uh, I think you're still kind of publishing thoughts and things. Um, so Mark said, you know, pretty uh, well-established thought leader. So definitely look, him, look into him and, and I think you can gain a tremendous amount of insight into the markets um, and what's going on. Thanks, uh, Matt, let's uh, jump to you and get some thoughts. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, will you answer? Oh, go for oh, it. Oh, matter, Christian. Sorry, Keenan. Let's no, go for it. <laughs> All right, my apologies, Matt. Um, I think the answer to when to get in touch, the, the right answer is, is, is yesterday, I think. Um, you know, the, as I said earlier, the lifeblood of our business is, is conversations and building relationships with entrepreneurs and management teams. So um, I think Keenan will distribute our contact information, um, you know, following this. And look, e even if, you know, I, I said at the onset, some of our, you know, the, our sweet spot, e even if the company or your company is not in the sweet spot today for a, you know, a deal, um, we're in a very long sales cycle business and we recognize that. So um, the earlier we can start chatting and getting to know you and your business, um, you know, I think, I think the better partners will be, uh, you know, down the road when there is a potential fit. So um, please feel free to get in touch and, um, you know, happy to chat more on some of the things that, that we're seeing and learning through this with our portfolio companies. And then, um, you know, certainly if, if you're thinking about fundraising, um, we'd love to chat further. So thanks again, Keenan, for the opportunity and time. Awesome. Thanks, Christian. Yeah, th thanks, Keenan. Uh, similar to Christian and Mark, email's great. We're happy to ch chat now. Happy to chat today, tomorrow, you know, later this month. Um, reach out on LinkedIn. Easy to get connected there. And if you don't have my email address, and we look at, we typically invest in businesses in the kind of five to fifteen million dollars of annual recurring revenue. So, um, if you're in that range or if you're approaching that range, obviously feel free to get connected. We'd love to chat. Awesome. All right. Well, um, it looks like it's 12 on the dot. So I don't know how we pulled that off, but uh, <laughs> we hope to keep it nice and tight there. So again, to the three of you, thank you so much for joining. I think this has been tremendously helpful in helping everybody really understand what's going on and how they can fit in to all of our participants today. Thank you for joining. I really hope that this was a great learning experience. Um, again, feel free to reach out to me, feel free to reach out to anybody on the panel today. We will be circulating um, a follow-up email with everybody's contact info um, and looking forward to beginning a discussion. Stay safe out there and we will Thanks talk everyone. soon. Thanks. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone.